The Talk Station presents Faith Matters, a look at contemporary stories and issues from a faith perspective. Give me faith, trust what you Talk Station, Faith Matters. Hey, thanks for being with us here on Faith Matters here on the Talk Station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Got Reverend Robert Cornegie is with us from Associate Pastor Chapel by the Sea in Emerald Island, Reverend Carl Zorowski from St. Peter's United Methodist Church in Moorhead City. And our program is brought to you by Chapel by the Sea at eichapel.org. And I'm, I know at Chapel by the Sea, you're all getting ready for the summer too, right? Yeah, well, of course, this this next week is a big week and um, mm-hmm. Fashion Week, and so we've got lots of activities going on associated with that. And yes, we are getting ready for the summer. We're really excited. We're we're actually going to have sort of a a um, walk in opportunity for parents to bring their little kids, mm-hmm. you know, the two, threes, and fours over up until school's out. Mm-hmm. Those that want to take some time away, and in the mornings, and then um, during the summer, we're going to be doing some camps. Okay, that's cool. So, so as well as um, other other activities. So EI Chapel, exciting. yeah, eichapel dot org. If you want to catch up mm-hmm. with that, uh, first article I want to look at today is a, is something that was surprising. You know, we uh, folks who follow Catholicism uh, know that we had for the first time in centuries a pope that actually retired before Pope Francis and. And Pope Francis has been the head of the Catholic Church for seven years. I think it's right, Something seven like years that. now. Yeah, I yeah. think that's uh, right. But Pope Benedict is still there. Yeah. Uh, he's still uh, living in Rome and and still has uh, that title and still occasionally will issue uh, letters or words. And in a, in a letter that he wrote just recently, uh, he published a reflection on the abuse crisis, but also couched in how we got here. And and I think we can kind of read from this because guys, we've always talked about kind of how you know our slippery slope or our sign of the apocalypse, how the, how more morality is slipping away from us in many different factors. And he summarizes it in a couple of different ways. So I want to take from that. I'm not reading from his letter so much because I'm not sure the the it translates well. But um, the Catholic News Service had a an article on it in which they talked about how retired Pope Benedict XVI, acknowledging his role in helping the Catholic Church come to some terms with the clerical sexual abuse crisis beginning in the 1980s, wrote an article outlining his thoughts about what must be done now. But in it, he talked about some things we've talked about here. Is how do we how do we come to this point, especially in terms of our sexual morality? And he, he points to the uh, late 1960s. While I'm um, reading from the article, it says, While Western society at large was facing the death or disappearance of God in any moral compass, he said, the church's own moral theology suffered a collapse that rendered the church defenseless against these changes in society. And the changes in society he's, he's, he's particularly speaking of is the sexual revolution. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we are coming up on the 50th anniversary of Woodstock, uh, the drug, sex, and rock and roll mantra of the 60s, the um, uh, the Second Vatican Council, which was which was just in the mid 60s, and and Robert, all these things kind of parallel to point us 50 years later yeah. into into areas that we never thought we would go. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it wasn't just in America; it was. Really, all over, all over the the world of faith, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, and he says in here, he refers to it that there was a there was a collapse, you know, and a mis- and a, a redefinition of what revelation mm-hmm. entails and how do we interpret revelation. So there was a theological shift in how how you do uh, how you exegete the word, you know, how you pull the truth out of the word of God. And and it started shifting, and they they really didn't know how to stop it, and obviously it has gone into places that are horrifying with the priest scandals and all of that within the church. This all he's yes. he's basically saying this was, you know, here's the pit, here's how we got into it, and then the question is how do we get out of it? And so that's really a the 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 guy that wrote the article 
had his own opinions about that, but but the Pope's opinions are, are really the ones to pay attention to. Now he's coming from yeah. a he's much more conservative. Right. He's kind of the nope Pope. You know, <laughs> he's he's the one that would say, No, nah, you uh-huh. can't do that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so we have this new Pope and he's he's more conciliatory. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Polite he's way yep, of saying he's the yep Pope. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, Carl, I think in our own uh, Methodist tradition uh, where we have taken, uh, what is it, Albert Outler's uh, uh, definition of a scripture, reason, tradition, and experience as a idea of uh, Wesleyan theology. Uh, and the idea uh, is what he is saying is that the church started to downplay scripture, exactly. even, right. even as it made it more accessible after the right. Second Vatican Council. It started to downplay scripture and downplay tradition, and it became much more experiential. That's right. That's right. And and um, we are dealing with that very much in the United Methodist Church right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got the um, as we've talked on the show before about the uh, issues surrounding what is the church's view on same sex marriage. Uh, what is the church's view on um, somebody who is a practicing homosexual being ordained as clergy in the church? Um, you know, if you if you look to the scriptures and you look to the tradition of the church, the answer is very clear. Um, but when those get downplayed and the human experience uh, begins to uh, have more of a voice in that equation, then your theology begins to change. Yeah. And uh, you know, the, this Pope Benedict here, as you mentioned, Ben, he was a, a little more conservative, mm-hmm. um, and he talks in the article about how. There was a time when, uh, during the sexual revolution and all of this, that that things that he had written, books that he had written, were not acceptable anymore in some of the seminaries. And that people who were caught reading his books, the students, the seminarians, were labeled as unfit for the priesthood. And that if you were going to read his books, you needed to read them or hide them under a table and mm-hmm. not talk about it. <laughs> and so, you know, we see that from from some time back, there has been this push to get any conservative moral uh, voice in the church silenced. Yeah, if I could just segue on that, exactly, is that it's it's all about the authority of Scripture. Right. That's what it always comes down mm-hmm. to. Where do we where do we draw? Where do we position? the authority mm-hmm. is it in the word that the word is communicating to us and we are to change our lives adjust our lives to fit with that world conform view, to that the word. biblical yeah. worldview yeah, that right. it's it's telling us or do we adjust the word to fit the popular worldview well when we adjust the word we are taking the authority away from the word and claiming the authority for ourselves. That's exactly and, right. And one of the arguments you're going to hear from people is, well, why should we listen? Why should we follow the writings of some um, Bedouin people in the wilderness that are two, three, four thousand years old? Why should we listen to that? Well, yeah. because God gave them that word. God spoke to them when they wrote that word. God speaks to us when we read the word, when the read word is read aloud. It's not like just some other ancient text. This is a whole different thing we're looking at. And it, and it comes down to what you said. What is the authority of that scripture? Yeah, and sadly, the Catholic Church shifted some of that authority away from the word into the papal priestly position. And then they could determine basically the interpretation of the word. He he refers to a misreading of the Second Vatican Council and kind of in Protestantism, I think we have seen a, a misreading of what we what we term as experience in one of those four corners of that theology is that is that experience is now your worldly experience as much as it is your scriptural or your religious or your holiness uh, experience. That's right. And, well, yeah, and authority, biblical authority, goes along with the nature of God. If you don't understand the nature of God, that he is timeless, he exists outside of time. You mm-hmm. can talk about two to 3,000 years ago. That's nothing. It's, it's nothing. It's still now. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> exactly. Still now. He is he's, uh, immutable. He doesn't change. Mm-hmm. You know, he is, he is perfect. 
and he knows everything. And so those arguments of about, you know, time of revelation and all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff, I mean, they're, they're irrelevant. They're, and, they're and, missing the point. They don't understand who this God really is. And when you read the scriptures, like right now we're doing a study on uh, the book of Genesis, and we're up with Joseph and his brothers. You look at the scriptures, the other thing they show us is that people haven't changed either. Okay? <laughs> yes, we have. It, it may be more convenient to sin now than it was 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. But human nature has not changed, mm-hmm. and neither has God's nature. Yeah, exactly. And and I think that one of the things that, that Pope Benedict is saying here is we decided or the church decided at some point to say, you know what, let's let's change the church to match who we are, to match our society, because society has changed, so the church must change. Yeah. But God has never changed and society has never changed. Well, it's fascinating, isn't it, that he has diagnosed that problem that way, that he has said it right. was that period of time. Mm-hmm. And some of the symptoms, the, the symptoms were the sexual revolution and the mm-hmm. liberalization sure. of theology mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. all those other things. Sure, those were but, symptoms. But the problem was the <laughs> theology shift. Mm-hmm. Let's stay with the subject a little bit in our next segment because I think we, he, we also need to address uh, some of the things that he said about what must be done. Uh, So we'll go to that in our next segment, and I think also relates to some of our other stories this week, too, as we continue on here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240, and brought to you by Chapel by the Sea in Emerald Isle at eichapel.org. And welcome back to Faith Matters here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, pastor of Broad Creek United Methodist Church. Also, Reverend Robert Cornegay from Chapel by the Sea in Emerald Island. And Reverend Carl Zorowski from St. Peter's United Methodist Church in Moorhead City. Uh, we were talking about uh, Pope Benedict the the 16th, 17th, uh, the, uh, who uh, wrote a, uh, a letter, a message. Actually, and it was published in the German outlet, first of all, and, and include a, the message includes a number of German references as well, too. So it's sort of German-centric in, in, uh, in part, but in its essence, it applies to all of us about how did we get here? With our state of our morality in in our church and in our in the world, and he goes back to point to um, both a misreading of the Second Vatican Council, but also specifically how the world basically became the church became um, knocked on the door of the world really mm-hmm. for their influence, and and this happened in the in the mid sixties, late sixties, certainly going into seventies, we saw this in Protestantism as well. Uh, and, and basically, if you want to sum it up, take the old 60 phrase, if it feels good, do it. Uh, and now it's, if it feels good, well, what's wrong with it? Exactly. Yeah, or if it feels good, it must be right. Yeah, yeah. That now has kind of become the mantra of, well, as you said, Robert, in the last segment, how we have taken the word and to make it justify what we're doing. And, and to take it a step further, it's it's like we say, well, Lord, you know, the Bible says this is wrong, but it feels good, so can you accommodate me? And we expect that God says, you know what, you're right. If it, if it makes you happy, then then that's okay. And if you want to say that my word meant this and that makes you feel better, and isn't that what you keep getting back yeah, to? You know, how, it, how, how, how does it, it make feel. us feel? Um, right. And God, you know, that we expect God to go, well, if it makes you feel better to read it this way, then I'll... I'll give you a pass. Yeah, just one quick little look back um, on on where how we got into this situation. You know, there were parts of Vatican II that weren't bad, and I think you mentioned it, mm-hmm. where the it, the word became more accessible. That's mm-hmm. when they shifted from the Latin to the vernacular. To the vernacular. Mm-hmm. And so, so, and a lot of people, some people, a group of people, push yeah. back on that. Sure, but you know, the the idea is that, that you know the Koine Greek was the common Greek language that's what a lot of this was written in so so it was it was the everyday greek it wasn't the academic greek and so that's Mm -hmm. what the bible who the bible is really composed for so that the average person can Mm -hmm. sit down and understand what god is saying now they may need some help along the way but basically that's that so that's not bad 
Now, what what did happen, though, was this loss of authority and understanding. We kind of lost the anchor. The anchor, uh, I was thinking about it yesterday at a funeral for my brother and thinking about how, you know, he lost, in his life, he kind of lost the anchor of his life. And so his boat started drifting. And that's literally that's, what that's has happened, happened in the church. Once you deny the authority, the inerrancy, the accuracy of Scripture, then you lose your anchor and you get tossed to and fro by opinion, basically, or mm-hmm. feelings, or experiencing. And, and that's the dilemma we're in. So we know how we got there. We know where we are. Now how do we get out of it? Uh, Pope Benedict is saying that uh, what must be done, he says, uh, creating another church will not work because that experiment has already been undertaken and already failed. I don't know if he's referring to Protestants or not. I'm not sure that. Yeah, that's Uh, right. I would say it succeeded exceptionally well. Uh, Only (laughs) only obedience and love for our Lord Jesus Christ can point the way, so let's first try to understand anew from within what the Lord wants and, uh, and what Anne has wanted with us he wrote now and that can only come through scripture it can only come through our study of the word that's right and and we we also as the church we have a responsibility to teach people about the authority of scripture and how to read scripture because scripture is not read like a newspaper it's not read like a magazine or a novel it is it is a whole different type of literature and there's a theologian who teaches at duke named stanley Hauerwas, and i believe time magazine named him as the most important theologian of the 20th century um and Howard Walsh wrote a book. As long as he comes book. with a seven-second delay. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> as long as he comes with a seven-second delay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. this is true. He doesn't need that seven-second delay. Um, but, but Howard Walsh wrote a book called Unleashing the Scriptures. And the premise of the book is that the Scriptures need to be taken out of the hands of everybody in North America except those who have gone through seminary training on how to read the Scriptures. And his point was that without the knowledge of how to read it, you cherry pick. And you find, you say, well, I want to do this. And look, this verse right here justifies my doing it. But you don't read it in context of the rest of the verses around it, of the rest of yeah. the story, of the whole flowing <clears throat> story of God's plan of salvation. Well, kind so, of, kind of, uh, I would say, say a typical of kind of Hauerwas's kind of over the top nature. Yeah, right, that, right. He know, was way over the yeah. top. I thought, no, you verbally, can't take the scripture yeah. away from everybody. Yeah. But we, as the church, we can't lead people to follow Christ and get stop drifting if they don't understand what the word says and unless we teach them the word and we read it properly and teach them how to read the word properly it's not going to happen yeah let me give you an example that just happened today to me uh we have on our morning show uh it's jerry the science guy and Mm -hmm. he often tells about what he's doing any particular day and he had bible study he said they were been studying revelation and they were just finishing it up and we all know how difficult it can be to actually study Revelation. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, well, when you're done, take, take Revelation and sit down and read it all the way through. Don't stop. Don't look up words. Don't make notes. Don't read the cliff notes on it or, anything, or try to imagine what other people say about what it's, how it's interpreted. Just read it because that's how the church read it. Right. Mm-hmm. And and I think we we in a long in many ways we need to get back to reading a letter like a letter. We need yes. to get back to reading uh, uh, exactly. uh, proclamations like proclamations. Well, exactly, and understand that Paul's letters were um, they were particular letters written to a particular audience in a particular place in a particular time, dealing with a particular issue. And well, and 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 you can't just pull something out of that. And make it apply in the way you want without that whole holistic understanding. Understanding. Well, you know, there's a simple principle. It's it's that a text taken out of context is a pretext. Yes. So so what you you're right. You have to have the context. It's got to be interpreted within the context. So it's 
Scripture interpreting Scripture mm-hmm. rather than someone else right. using something else to interpret Scripture. Mm-hmm. So you really have to keep it in that context. And then with with the, the inspiration of God, right, that's the, mm-hmm. that's the key to this whole thing, that authority issue, that this word is not just Paul's thoughts on this. He, I mean, inspired. it includes it, yeah. but it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Under the unction anointing of the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. and so it carries a an application for that current context, but it's prophetic as well. Yes, yes. it yes. speaks prophetically down well, and down well, through the ages. Well, so I think you to, you can use the context of what Paul was do, going through, and like you said, people really haven't changed. So no. it's 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 relevant whether it was a thousand years ago when it was written or two thousand years ago really and um or whether it's now. It's so, God so by the spirit. For example, inspiring. when Paul talks about sacrificing meat to idols, I mean we're not doing that. Right. Uh, but uh but you you can talk about his overall understanding of what it means to be a stumbling block to somebody's right. Uh, right. uh understanding of Christ. So right. we that's where we take from that story in that's that context. Exactly right. But so to go back to but what Pope Benedict I think is angling at here cuz what we saw in the late 60s and 70s and we still see today is the rise of uh, um, two examples devotional um understanding of of faith. In other words, many people their only understanding of what the Bible says is a devotion they read. Yes. See, I don't, I don't say that's not a bad thing, but I say it can't be the only thing. That's exactly right. That's right. And and the the other part is that we do tend to often, even in our Bible study, sit and dissect every word right. instead right. of right. thinking of this as its as its message and it and it's in, as its whole. Mm-hmm. And um and and I'm guilty of that. I want to go run sure. to the Greek dictionary and find out what this word means here and how was it used in context and all sure. that. Sure, and it, it can it's, add flavor. It's great to do, you know. The, the, but it, if that's impeding, you know, the the paralysis of analysis yes. is yes. what it's called. Yeah, <laughs> it, and it exactly is that. Yeah, you can get so caught up in the minutia that you miss the point entirely mm-hmm. so that's where i think that pope benedict is saying is that we got away from scripture as being the primacy and we got into this experiential thing as being primacy right and then uh and and it's sort of like justified by scripture and so we yeah, and we quit listening to god and listen to ourselves instead and by getting back to the scriptures we're going to start listening to god again well, you, you remember back in the late '60s, early '70s, were when the were when the French um, postmodern writers, Foucault, others were starting to say, "You need to interpret life from your perspective, not mm-hmm. from the perspective of what you're seeing." In other words, you know this whole thing about exegeting, pulling truth out of the word, or eisegesis reading your truth into it. it. This revolutionized um, the university, academia, and it it has bled over Mm -hmm. into the church. And so we we just started going with the ways of the world. And so what we have to do is get back to a correct hermeneutical understanding interpretation. Our method of of interpreting the word we need to um, examine. More to come in a moment here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240, uh, with uh, Reverend Carl Zorowski and Reverend Robert Cornegy. I'm Ben Bald. Be back in a moment. Welcome back to Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben, along with uh, Reverend Carl Zorowski and Reverend Robert Cornegy. And here we are taking a look at another article. This has also been uh, certainly trending in the news these days. This is from PJ Medium, and their faith column says, uh, Gay presidential hopeful Pete Buttigieg uh, lectures Trump and evangelicals on biblical sexual ethics. South Bend, Indiana, Mayor Pete Buttigieg uh, came out swinging at President Trump and Christians on Meet the Press Sunday after host Chuck Todd asked him about evangelical support for the president. You said something rather strong about the president, that you said it's hard to look at his actions to believe that they are the actions of somebody who believes in God. 
How do you square that assessment with the fact that the evangelical Christian community is so devoted, devoted to his candidacy, Todd asks. Mayor Pete, as the fawning media has dubbed him, called evangelicals who support Trump hypocrites. Here you have somebody who not only acts in a way that's not consistent with anything that I hear in Scripture or in church, where it's about lifting up uh, uh, the least among us and taking care of strangers, which is another word for immigrants. Mm. Let that sit. Uh, Buttigieg said, and making sure that you're focusing your efforts on the poor, but also personally how you're supposed to conduct yourself, not chest thumping, look at meism, but humbling yourself before others. Okay, first of all, uh, the the straw man argument or the straw man d- discussion that Chuck Todd presents is the is the first thing we all need to take issue with, because I don't know any evangelical that believes that that President Trump is the next messiah that believes that he is the that he is the well, is no, is going to be the that. epitome there of Christianity. There are those that believe he is the current. Um, King what, Darius or yeah Cyrus Cyrus yeah who God used a a non-believer to deliver Israel from right. the Babylonian captivity that's, I mean I've that's, heard that argument yeah that's much more the analogy I mean, yeah that's believers. right yeah. as not the Messiah although there may be some that think that but it's a it, uh, it's a minority position hmm. huge minority but po- uh, as, I, minority as, position. as I said during the break nobody after his presidency is going to say oh we need to have him as our preacher no no not at all not at all and Let's, it really is issues uh, from what I the way I came to this as a evangelical Christian was that it was the issues and and I I preferred his position on the issues over the alternative. And so it was sort of a, you know, the least worst choice Mayor, available Mayor, at the time. Mayor Pete here, Buttigieg, was, uh, was making some headlines for actually criticizing Mike Pence. Oh, I know. And, uh, and uh, considering him to be hypocritical for his support of the president and, and in his beliefs. Um, and here he is. Um, he uh, is uh, attends Episcopal Church, and as a gay man married to a, uh, another gay man, and and um, as a mayor. But as a mayor, Mike Pence had lauded him before that, saying this is one of this is one of the guys who's doing things right in his city uh, as a mayor and as a Democrat is doing things right in the city. So. And this was not in regard to his sexuality. Well, had that's right. to do or with his it. faith. Or his you faith. know, Pence Pence was only speaking in terms of Policy. this man was elected to do this job. He is doing it well, mm-hmm. and that was it. That was it. No, no um, agenda. No critique. Anything like that. But now, when this guy looks like he's going to run for president, no, the, the, he, the knives have to come out. Yeah, they, they come out. He's, yeah, it's so. And he he actually calls both Trump and uh, and well not just both Trump and Pence but also all evangelicals as being hypocritical, mm-hmm. and he can't you know that's like he can't see the speck in his eye or the, he can't see the telephone pole in his eye because he's looking at the specks in other eyes. Mm-hmm. So you know we really got a problem here with this guy. He has a he has a double standard in how he you know thinks about the straw man is his definition of mm-hmm. what an evangelical christian is but how much uh, just considering the last two segments that we talked about this is the this is again the result of that slipping away mm-hmm. of uh, scriptural authority yeah right and and where where robert was talking earlier about the difference between exegesis and eisegesis and and those listeners today you can use those words in everyday conversation well, actually we don't but <laughs> no. um but what we're seeing here is him taking this thing where it says the bible says that we are to welcome strangers or show love to to the marginalized and the strangers and this means immigrants well he has decided that that's what it's going to mean for his use of the scripture yeah and so he is Isogeting his meaning into it. He's reading it into it. Absolutely. Right. And, and find, that, find what's going to support my political view. Exactly. That's and, exactly and, right. And then, and then it shows that the church is behind me 100%, and yeah. that's not what's happening. 
Well, it can include, um, uh, you know, sure, immigrants. it can include sure. immigrants, but it includes wayfarers, those passing yeah. through. I right. mean, you know, strangers right. is, was not limited to just, you know, uh, people that were running for their lives from something. It was it was a bigger context than that. And those this, who have lost their way. That's exactly you know. right. The sad part of this is that he, it, he's he's bright and shiny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And no, most people have no clue who this guy is, but he's saying things in a way that seems so moral and so, you know, he's so pure, and and that's the way the media is is interpreting and promoting him, mm-hmm. is that as this one are. doesn't have the baggage that everybody else has. But then when you start digging down doing your due diligence on mm-hmm. him the baggage comes out it comes out in the article when he was asked when does life begin and he said i don't know i don't think it can be known now this that that is just you talk about that's a that's a that's a hypocritical position because it avoids is avoiding the question completely. Yeah, and so but he's basing his entire position on late term abortions on the fact that he ad, he's saying he he's admitting that his position is he doesn't know. Well, if you don't know, don't kill him. You know that's that. Yeah. yeah, do no harm. <laughs> and and he also he also talks about how. The religious right, that the uh, religious rights version of Christianity is about sexual ethics. Well, that may be a part of it, mm-hmm. but there's a whole lot more than that. I mean, part of our part of uh, Christianity is reaching out to those on the margins, loving your neighbor, loving your enemy. Uh, praying for those who persecute you. That's all part of it. But he is he is taking all the evangelical Christians and just putting us all in one group, say all you guys care about is the homosexual thing. That's which, all you care about. Which is paradoxical because that's his primary identity point is mm-hmm. his gayness. Mm-hmm. So he, he's actually condemning himself right. in and, the process. And, and, and he is... He is Taking a, a broad brush approach and saying that um, anybody who is an evangelical hates gays and judges gays. Yeah. And the fact is, that's not who we are. Who we are is we love everybody, we welcome everybody. Everybody is created in God's image, everybody is valuable. As part of God's creation, everybody needs to, to come to know Christ, and that's what we're about. It's so sad that these that in these interviews, when these people have an opportunity, the interviewer has an opportunity. I mean, Ben, you're a great interviewer, and you know how to dig deep and you know you don't stop yeah, with good. just that boilerplate answer. You go to the next level and then to the next level. Yeah, I've seen, you know, I've why seen Ben you, stump you before. Yeah, the yes. interviewer can stump <laughs> that's you. Right. That's that's good. And he and so you know you're getting to the why do you believe what you believe. Mm-hmm. You say what you say because of your beliefs. Why do you believe? What was it? What is the evidence that makes you believe that? And they never do that. They just take yeah. that first thing and stop right there. Stop there. That they is, do yeah. not. They do not do invest. In, I can't say it. Investigative. <laughs> Thank you. Reporting. You know journalism, which is you keep peeling the onion back till you get to the real root cause mm-hmm. of this stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the sad part of this. The media is building a persona. They're building a, a we can't say a straw man, but a false uh-huh. front, right. f- facade. A facade is a good of one. this this particular candidate. And they're putting you know, it's interesting how they're they're kind of walking away from some of the earlier and now this guy they're they're turning all their adoration <laughs> towards him. Don't trust the media, y'all. It's just and, not and, trustworthy. You know, at this point, do your own research. At this point, even if even if the party were to say, "Well, we do want Hillary to be our candidate," it can't happen because for the media, she's old news now. Yeah, that's right. They've got they've got shiny new toys mm-hmm. 
to mm-hmm. uh, to wave around. Well, uh, well. Speaking of that, let's uh, let me just uh, segue into this other one because this is a conversations that we are having here in this uh, studio, but it's often ones that are not being had from the pulpit. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, an article in Christian Headline says half of pastors are concerned that they will offend someone if they speak on social issues. Again, let's go back to this idea of experiential uh, uh, dominance of of our lives over the scriptural and traditional. Uh, and recent, even for that matter, it says a new report from the Barner Group, which we've had on here, uh, is a nine out of ten Christian pastors said they feel that helping Christians form biblical beliefs about specific issues is a major part of their job. The report found that pastors face pressure to address specific, sometimes hot button issues. However, at the same time, pastors said they struggled with just how to address those topics, such as LBGT issues and same sex marriage. The stakes are high in the public square, the researchers wrote in their report. The issues pastors feel most pressured to speak out on are the same ones they feel limited to speak on. We'll talk about that as pastors, too, coming up in just a moment on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Welcome back here in, on I'm sorry, say Coastal Daybreak, but we know it's Faith Matters. We invite you to listen to Coastal Daybreak, Monday through Friday, uh, 6 to 9. There we and go. And that's his best. Yes. <laughs> it's Friday, folks. It's Friday, yeah. <laughs> At least when we're recording it, not when you're listening to it. But in, then it, yeah, we're confusing people now. But, <laughs> Uh, let's get back to confused pastors instead. Yeah, uh, well. th- this is a uh, the story that we uh, prefaced at the end of the last segment. It was talking about a report from the Barner Group saying that half of Christian uh, pastors said they felt occasionally or frequently limited in their ability to speak out about controversial issues. I have no doubt. I mean, I've only been assigned to one church. It's my twelfth year, but I still, I, I mainly because I I don't feel like always that's my purpose. Being, well, you know exactly. It's, there's a if the if my, what I think is my purpose about preaching the gospel spills over into controversial issues, fine. But I'm not going to start at the issue and right. lay back. I mean, I have uh, spoken about what's going on with the Methodist Church, and that wasn't easy. No. But but I also tied it in exactly to where we were in our scripture and what yeah. and what what's in our scripture life. So. Mm-hmm. Tried to, uh, tried to do that, but that's. I mean, you guys tell me. I mean, you you find it. All right. Well, let's let's just let's say that you get up one Sunday, and the scripture uh, through the scripture, God has led you to address the problem of premarital sex, or people living together uh, outside of the bonds of marriage. Okay, how willing are you to stand up there and say? cohabitation is wrong cohabitation is not what god wants if you're shacking up right now you know stop you, it you you <laughs> need you need to make change okay mm-hmm. this is not what god wants you to do okay how many of us are willing to stand up there and do that yeah you you, you end up losing people out of church and unfortunately that's part of the problem is we as the the leaders in the church we have to think about well it's important that we have people here. Why? People coming to church keep the lights on in the church. Yeah, and yeah. if we start running people away, the lights don't stay on. But then what we're doing is we're compromising the Word. Yeah. And we're we're not giving the Word <clears throat> the authority that oh, it needs. That's right. Well, and the thing is you can do it. Or that it deserves. You can do it through the Word because every issue is addressed. Mm-hmm. Whether right. not not maybe not directly, right. but indirectly. And so, you know, the woman at the well, the story of the woman at the well, that's a powerful story Mm -hmm. about relationships and, you know, how many marriages did she have? Mm -hmm. And what was this? And this one is not your husband. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so you can, you can use the scripture and Pat, it's not your opinion that you're preaching. You're going back to the word of God. And that that has, see, that's. So many lessons there. They're just there. Yeah. They, we just have to dig them out. Mm-hmm. And the preparation of thinking, how do I use? The, how do I use the Word of God? Because we in, want in helping pe- in the context of the Word. You know, because because we want 
them to see the revealed word of God. Yes, right. It's, exactly. It's not like you must see it as I see it. Yeah, that's no, right. We want, we want God to, to be speaking yeah. to them. They hear God speaking, and they come to realize for themselves, you know what? I need to change. I need to change my life. And that's the technique that, that Jesus used in the parables. Mm-hmm. He used the parables as a way to put the person in the context of, of the revelation that he was saying. Mm-hmm. And so he used the, the surroundings that they were familiar with so that they were, they, oh, yeah, I'm, I, you know, I know about that. And, and they could con- – now, a lot of people, it just went Phew, right over their head. They didn't get it. But the ones that were in that context that mm-hmm. were, you know, like the woman at the well mm-hmm. – you didn't have to put it up on the big screen. That's right. <laughs> you know that they know they're. Look, we all have a conscience. We all have the the moral law written on our hearts. We know, generally speaking, when we're doing wrong, mm-hmm. well, and yeah. and we make excuses. That's why we make excuses because we know we're, we ha- we're doing something wrong, so we have to try to justify it. Well, back to our first two segments. That's how Pope Benedict said that uh, we got away from under from the relying on that natural law. We got away from that understanding and teaching what that is. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I go into a lot of churches and I have in the past and and continue to and talk about uncomfortable truths. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, abortion. Mm-hmm. You know, all of that stuff that goes along with that. These are uncomfortable things to talk about. So how do I do it? I give illustrations of life's changed by the gospel. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. these people in these circumstances, they have they have they have discovered the light in mm-hmm. the darkness, and the light has di- dispelled the darkness in their lives. And that's what we do there mm-hmm. at the pregnancy mm-hmm. center. That's right. It's it's you know it isn't that the pregnancy center has needs. It's those that we serve have needs, well, and so come and partner with us in that process. So so it's and and then they get to go through that process. You know he was kind of preaching. You know I remember <laughs> first time I walked in Chapel by the Sea, Pastor Thomas was up there and he was preaching a message, and I thought this dude, this guy's he's he's. He's talking to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he never, mm-hmm. never pointed his finger at me or yeah, anything. That's right. But my heart, even though was he wanted to, strangely warm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was. I was touched mm-hmm. by what he was saying. And do you know why that happened? Because, well, obviously it was the Holy Spirit that did that. Yeah. But as pastors, you know, when we speak the truth, the Bible tells us to speak the truth. How? in love and if i stand up there and give this sermon and point my finger and say you can't shack up okay that sounds like me expressing my view on these people but if i present the scripture and then i say and you know what god is saying to me in this scripture is this you know this is this is what i'm reading out of this and so when i when i share these truths with you you know god is going to speak to you and and speak to your heart and uh it's it's not up to us to tell people how to live or what to do it is up to us to help them discern what the truths are in the scriptures so that they can hear god speaking to them my shaking my finger in judgment is going to shut their ears absolutely to ever hearing what god well, is and that's say. why you know the scripture says judge not lest you be judged right and so so and, and really what that scripture is saying is that we are not to prejudge people that's right you know this is not our responsibility this is whether you're a pastor or whoever mm-hmm. you are our our job is to just model number mm-hmm. one live a righteous life and to speak the authority of God that this is God's and God will work that out He will get them to that place of recognizing correcting I mean there are times when That's you right. do have to correct there are times oh, but sure. you do and, it and scripturally a biblically, and biblical in way love, to do that in yeah. love absolutely right. with this with the intention of reconciliation mm-hmm. not of punishment. That's that's right. That's right. You look you look for grace and mercy. That's right. And not you know, judgment. he said that, you know, some who someone I can't remember who who asked it said, you know, how are we going to clean up the church? There are people in here that shouldn't be in here. 
I'm paraphrasing, <laughs> right? Yeah. And what did he say? Yeah. He said, "Don't worry. Don't the wheat and the tares. Yeah. Don't no. worry about the tares. God will settle that. The angels <laughs> <laughs> will take care of that. Yeah. Don't don't become a a terrorist." <laughs> Oh, uh, sorry. Boo. Boo. <laughs> no, I wish I had a notification. I had a rim you, you shot. You cut that out of the All right, now. <laughs> but, 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 again, relating to all of what we have said here today is that um, – and one other story. Let me. I'm going to bring in the Joe Biden story. Okay. okay. Uh, because here we have uh, an uncomfortable situation <laughs> where where we have people who, uh, who said that they felt uncomfortable about his – his touching them or his being around them and the way he acted. And, and frankly, you know, this is not unusual even in church. I mean, after all, we have times of greetings and uh, some people hug and some people don't. Some people want you to, to come right up to you and, and some people don't. We we have lessons that are taught in our, in our classes. We have classes on sexual ethics that say, don't do that. And I remember coming out of a class the very first Sunday, a 90-year-old woman came up to me and gave me a great big bear hug. So... Well, where where is the balance between the uncomfortableness of uh, of a weird uncle <laughs> feeling that we're getting from this Joe Biden vibe here of uh, from some of these stories versus uh, where we can approach people in Christian love uh, and I mean after all it was the uh, a Christian kiss was the, the holy kiss was the holy kiss was part of it so. Where where do we fall in that? Because I think, frankly, our churches are a place where that is most uncomfortable part. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and the uh, a lot of that is cultural. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, really, it's not. You know, there is an affection that we have for the for the body of Christ as being a part of the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. You know, we have been given a, I, I believe, in a, 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 a love. The fruit of the spirit. One of the fruits of the spirit is love. And so there's an affection that's there, but it's a pure affection, that holy kiss thing. I mean, mm-hmm. that's, that's really showing that it's a different kind of thing. I know when we were living in Europe, you know, when you greeted someone, you did a three kiss yeah. to the cheek. But, I mean, you didn't kiss, but you just touched. We have to develop our own sensitivities to how other people react to that, too. Yeah, so that's, exactly. that's, that, that's important. Anyway, thanks for joining us today on Faith Matters, brought to you by Emerald Isle Chapel by the Sea at eichapel.org, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you for joining us for Faith Matters. To revisit today's program or to find more episodes, visit thetalkstation.com. Give me faith, trust what you is a production of the talk station.